Welcome, friends. It's good to see all of you again. Um, we're very excited for this. This is a very important uh, hybrid forum on end the lockdowns and justice reinvestment. Uh, my name is Emilio Dottore. I'm the executive director of the Milwaukee Turners here at Turner Hall. And we're very excited to be able to bring everyone together here. Uh, also, those of you who have joined us online, uh, of course, with our friends from Wisdom uh, and Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Allied for Hope, also known as MICA, and with our other guests. And we'll introduce everybody in just a couple of moments. I just want to review some logistics uh, for those of us uh, who have just joined or are joining online. Uh, you're here in Turner Hall, which is a national uh, city and county historic landmark. Uh, this, this forum is being broadcast live also and will be edited and shared later so that you, uh, and, and you should share this with your friends and family members and you should share this on your respective social media or email. And we'll talk a little about some action items at the end. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, we talked about some of the logistics uh, of the building. And for those of you who are joining us online, captioning is available, so please click on the live transcript CC icon to use captioning or to turn it off. You can click show subtitle and click view full transcript to see the full captioning stream. We also have ASL interpreters who are available uh, as well on Zoom and they will be using Zoom's sign language interpretation view. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this may still be new for a few folks, so you can uh, contact Ryan, who's assisting us with online communications and questions. After a, pres uh, after a presentation on the their End the Lockdowns campaign by our friends from Wisdom and Micah, there will be an opportunity for the public to provide three-minute testimonies and questions that our panelists will respond to, and this is a very important part of this forum. There is a space marked out here for folks to make a line when we get to that after the presentation. And uh, very important that we protect the safety of our loved ones who are incarcerated. We ask that you do not use the names of any of our uh, brothers and sisters who are currently incarcerated. So you can, if they've given you a letter or shared some sort of information or you want to share about their story, please just omit their names. Our panelists today include uh, Mark Rice and James Wilbur of Wisdom and State Representative Darren Madison and State Representative Ryan Clancy. If uh, there are some of you who wish to uh, share but don't feel comfortable speaking in public, please raise your hand and one of our Turner staff will bring you an index card or a pen and paper and then we'll raise that for you. For those of you who are joining us online, if you have a question you'd like to submit, uh, Ryan will curate those questions and then I will read them for you with my best Brooklyn accent. Uh, today's, again, today's nonpartisan virtual forum is being hosted by the Milwaukee Turners, Wisdom and Micah. Just a little brief statement from us uh, to kind of set the tone. The conditions of confinement facing our incarcerated neighbors, friends and family are completely unacceptable. We're at an important crossroads right now, and the opportunity for healing, advancement, and redemption remains minimal, while the chance for increased trauma and denial of basic human rights remains all too high. We all know what the criminal legal system does to people. Wisconsin is one of the worst states for incarceration in this nation, and this is exacerbated from police encounters to re-entry. We are failing. Which brings us to today. Everyone here is very interested in learning more about both the current situation and possible solutions. So I'd like to turn it over to our panelists now so we can learn more about Wisdom's and the Lockdowns campaign and provide some input on transformational justice priorities in Wisconsin. With that, I'd like to pass it over to James Wilbur. Hi, everybody. I uh, really appreciate you all being here. Uh, I know it's you know very busy season, and so we're just very grateful that you're here. Um, so that we can have this really important discussion. Uh, I'm the Director of Prison Outreach for Wisdom Wisconsin, and my role with Wisdom is to really serve the voice of the incarcerated population. Um, Wisdom is committed to bringing attention uh, to the voices of those incarcerated so that we're able to hear their stories, their testimonies, we are able to involve them in our strategies and our policy making decisions about the things that we do. And so my role is to correspond directly with thousands of men and women on the inside and to elicit those stories, to elicit their ideas and their solutions about what is going on in our system and how to effectively remedy that. 
Um, and one of the foremost initiatives that we're really proud of is we have what's called the Relational Voter Program. And what that program is designed to do is to conduct outreach through our incarcerated men and women to really get in touch with the most difficult communities that are generally most resistant to participating in the voting process. And how we go about doing that is we work with our incarcerated population and we ask them um, to do the work of civic engagement and political education with their contacts in the community. And through that process, we are able to really introduce the importance of voting, to really highlight the fact that on average, elections in Wisconsin are generally decided between four to seven percentile percentile points. And so we know that if we can get people out and voting in these responsible ways for criminal legal reform, that's going to make all the difference. So we're really excited to have that initiative going uh, on in Wisdom, Wisconsin. And we also really invite our incarcerated men and women to participate in our community organizing processes. And what that looks like is we provide a lot of community organizing education, political education. We have a variety of task force where they're able to speak about things such as sentencing guidelines, reentry, conditions of confinement. And so it, again, you know, it really just highlights their voice. It elevates their voice. It makes them know that you may be incarcerated, but your voice is not insignificant. And that's something that wisdom stands on. It's a conviction that we absolutely hold quite dear, and we are committedly working to continue to build that infrastructure to be able to do that. So that's just a little bit about my role and what I do with wisdom. You want to speak about in the lockdowns? Sure, yeah. absolutely. So. You know, one of the main reasons that we're here is to, is to really bring attention to the policies of the Department of Corrections, the broken, the fractured policies that the Department of Corrections has implemented and continues to implement that are directly responsible for the state of our current lockdowns. So we know that in Waupun and in Green Bay, dating back through March, the Department of Corrections began implementing a lockdown procedure at those facilities. The DO has consistently wavered on what they have said has been the basis for these lockdowns, but we know that those conditions have extended again since through March, and I receive testimonies every single day from the men in those facilities who are talking about their inability to access adequate health care, about the fact that they are being confined into their cells for up to 23 and one half hours a day without meaningful access to opportunities for programming, without being able to contact their loved ones. We just recently received testimony that one block in Waupun actually went 13 days without receiving a shower. These men are being confined into their cells and they are being left languishing. They are, they are in physical facilities that are infested with rodents. There is um, bird droppings in their cells. There are rats and mice that are crawling under their cells. They are being left, we are coming up on winter, and they are being left with one thin, tiny blanket. These men are suffering. And a point that I want to make really, really clear is the testimony that I am getting from these men, none of these men are saying that they did not commit a wrong. Very rarely do I ever hear somebody say, well, I don't deserve to be here. These men recognize the choices that they made, but they are looking for opportunities for restoration, for reconciliation, for redemption, to be able to come back into their societies as productive and law-abiding people. And the Department of Corrections continues to take action that violates the very humanity of these men. This is not just a matter of very basic uh, violations. We, we recently had one man, I just want to give a brief testimony, who has a, neuro, uh, a, neuro, a neurological disability, and he was treated at a local uh, facility by a neurosurgeon. When he returned back to the institution, the Department of Corrections blatantly refused to provide the treatment that the neurosurgeon had ordered, simply said, we're not going to do that. And that's just one tiny example of the conditions that these men are being forced to endure. And it is a crisis. It is a human rights crisis. No one deserves to be locked into a seven by eight cage for up to 23 and one half hours a day, being fed cold meals, peanut butter and jelly for the course of eight months.
to not be provided with a shower, to not be able to go to a dentist and deal with an emergency situation, to not be able to talk to your family, your loved ones, your friends in the community. These are inexcusable conditions. And Mark, Mark Rice, my colleague, he's going to talk about some of the solutions. But the DOC has consistently said they will not take the responsible, decisive leadership that is needed to reduce mass incarceration, to close down these decrepit, ancient facilities that are not fit for human habitation. That is what the Department of Corrections is saying by their inaction. They are saying, we are not going to do what is necessary to provide meaningful care, meaningful rehabilitation, meaningful opportunity for these men who are confined. And it is ongoing. The, the Department of Corrections and the governor talked about how they are introducing sweeping measures to alleviate these conditions at Waupun and Green Bay Institution. The reality, there are no sweeping measures. Every single day, I receive tens of dozens of emails from men who are telling me about these ongoing conditions that they're facing. These men are the husbands, the sons, the grandsons, the friends of people in the community, and they are being treated as though their humanity does not matter. And it is completely unacceptable. There is no call for it, there is no reason for it, and the Department of Corrections is in a position to immediately and decisively end the lockdowns now. Thank you. Thank you. Again, my name is Mark Rice. I currently serve as the Wisconsin Transformational Justice Campaign Coordinator at Wisdom. I got into this work due to my personal experience of going through Wisconsin's prison system. The state of Wisconsin enforcement has been two years in the state prison system back in 99 and 2000. I got out when I was 21 years old and I had to serve 12 years of community supervision after that. So I became very familiar with many of the problems in Wisconsin's community supervision system. And when I was in the state prison system, it was a really eye-opening experience for me. I witnessed the very deep racial injustice within Wisconsin's system. I met many young black and brown indigenous men coming in who had far longer sentences than I had, but even though they had been convicted of crimes less serious than the one I had been convicted of. And so now really decided to get in the movement for change and got involved with organizing and in the work that I'm doing now. Could you bring the PowerPoint presentation up? about justice reinvestment, appreciate it. I'm gonna talk about, so the transformational justice campaign of wisdom has four primary goals. Number one, we've always had a focus on cutting the state's prison population in half. We also focus on greatly reducing the number of people under community supervision. We also aim to advance racial justice. We wanna view everything through a racial justice lens and really focus on dismantling structural racism in Wisconsin. We also, aim to challenge dehumanizing narratives that are often used to label people with conviction records. So we often hear these dehumanizing and offensive terms like offender, predator, inmate. So we're pushing back on that and really centering the humanity of people who've been impacted by the system and really lifting that up through storytelling, but also reimagining what's possible. And we also do rights restoration work. But one of the key campaigns that I'm talking, the key things that I want to lift up tonight is our justice reinvestment campaign. So we're talking about moving resources out of the punishment system and into the communities that have been most impacted by incarceration. We know in Wisconsin, Wisconsin has for far too long been over-reliant on using courts, prisons, and police as responses to problems in our communities. So instead, we really want to, we want to shift that focus and greatly reduce the really some, Fundamentally, we want to reimagine how resources are allocated in the state of Wisconsin, and we do that by reducing the amount of resources we're spending on those punishment systems and putting the money back into the communities most impacted. So we know that investments in jobs, housing, health care, education are really going to produce the results that we want to see in terms of building safer, stronger, and healthier communities. So that's the main thing we're lifting up. You can go to the next one. So number one, our core, number one core demand right now is no new prisons in the state of Wisconsin. There's been a lot of talk about closing Green Bay Correctional Institution, closing Waupon Correctional Institution, but then building a new prison to replace Waupon or building a new prison to replace Green Bay. And we know that that's not necessary. So we want to really stand on that, say no new prisons. That is the number one demand. 
and really oppose any of that. So, next one. And then step two, so for a long time, Wisdom has been working to reduce the prison population. As I said, we launched a campaign called 11 by 15 back in 2011. Our goal was to cut the state's prison population to 11,000 by the end of 2015. And the transformational justice campaign is a continuation of that work. And one of the main issues that we've always worked on is expanding treatment alternatives in, to incarceration. We were really, Wisdom was one of the organizations that got the state's treatment alternatives and diversions program put it as, in as a state budgetary issue. It's been almost 20 years now that that's been a state budgetary program. We've been able to get some increases in funding for that program. So that's a program that gives people an opportunity to stay out of prison on the front end by putting people into treatment programs instead of going to prison. People who have mental health issues, people who have addiction issues. And that program, right now we're focusing on ensuring that resources are more equitably distributed for that program. We want to make sure that funds go to areas of the greatest need. So it's particularly black and brown and indigenous communities, particularly brown, black and brown communities in Milwaukee. So I wanna make sure that that's is something that is lifted up, that we're doing it from a racial equity perspective when we expand the funding, but also we need to make that program more inclusive so that people with all types of convictions can participate in the program. Right now, people with violent convictions are excluded, which makes no sense. And so we really wanna expand that program, expand inclusion and also expand the you know, improve the quality of the program that it's offered. And we can do that through state budgetary issues. You know, that's a state budget issue every two years. Also, we can greatly reduce the number of people that are being sent back to prison for what we call crimeless revocations. There was a study by Columbia Justice Lab in New York. That study found that 5,200 people are currently incarcerated in Wisconsin prisons due to a revocation without a new conviction or crimeless revocation. And that was, they used the Department of Corrections own data so that's one area that we really need to focus on. That's, we're talking about technical violations. So people under supervision have many rules that we, they have to follow. We're talking about, it can be something like crossing a county line without your agent's permission, unauthorized computer or cell phone use, accepting a job offer without your agent's pr approval. Those are the type of things, even being arrested for disorderly conduct or something like that, but then later on the charge gets dropped. That's what happened to me in one situation where I got sent to Milwaukee Security Detention Facility for almost six months because I got arrested for disorderly conduct while I was experiencing a mental health crisis, but then the charge was later dropped. But yet they, they took me, took six years of my, you know, six months of my life away, put me in Milwaukee Security Detention Facility for that. But the average amount of time that a person's going back for revocation is 18 months. 18 months, so that's a huge amount of resources that are being spent to put people back in for you know, without any new conviction. Another huge area where we can expand is in increasing the earned release program. There are many, there are thousands of people currently incarcerated who could participate in programming and get time cut off their sentence, get back into the community earlier. That program, there's a lot of ways that the Department of Corrections can do that internally. There can also be funding expanded for that program. Then also there's about 1,700 people who are still eligible for parole who were sentenced before 2000 under the old law. And that's another area where people need to be given a fair chance because they've been now incarcerated for over 23 years, people under the old law, which makes no sense. And so we gotta really go back and look at the excessive sentencing, really view it as a racial justice issue. We know that the, really that Wisconsin now incarcerates black people and indigenous people at a higher rate than any other state by some measures. So that's really an area, and compassionate release is another area. Of the, so there's a really aging population, the population in Wisconsin prison is growing older. There's a program that can be used, utilized more frequently called compassionate release that's really underutilized right now. And then we also really need to note that Governor Evers has the power to do a lot of this through commutations. He has executive authority to start commuting sentences, which would immediately release people back into the community. And also, the Department of Corrections completely controls the revocation process. So the Department of Corrections and Governor Evers have a lot of power in some of these policy areas, but also we definitely need to back it up with state legislative change. And that's why we got Representative Clancy, Representative Maddox in here to talk about the legislative piece, but we really need to emphasize that Governor Evers has the power to move a lot of this forward and the Department of Corrections has a lot of, they have the power to actually move a lot of this forward. So next piece. So definitely want to, close at least one prison. So we know just by the ending crimeless revocations, that would reduce the population by 5,200 people, which is more than the combined population of Waupun, Green Bay, and Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. 
and James talked about the horrific conditions of confinement in Mopan and Green Bay Correctional Institution, but also there's a prison right here that some have called the worst prison in the United States, Milwaukee Security Detention Facility. One of the former wardens, Floyd Mitchell, he went on Earl Ingram's show on public radio, said it was the worst prison in the United States. And it was built entirely just to hold people for allegedly violating rules of supervision. So nine out of 10 people there haven't been convicted of any crime. So it makes no sense. It's really at odds with common sense approaches to justice to have an entire state prison that's there just to hold people for crimeless revocations. And that's really something we've gained a lot of traction on about any crime certifications depopulating that. The Department of Corrections actually cut the population at MSDF by more than half during the COVID period, but they haven't followed through with those policy changes. They're starting to fill it back up. So they actually started to reduce incarceration for supervision holds. They started to move some of the programming within MSDF into community-based settings. They need to continue doing that instead of reversing course on that. We really need to continue that and you know, put money back into communities. So definitely all those prisons need to be closed and some more. So that's just a start. Closing Mopan and Green Bay, which had been over 100 years old, falling apart, there's no way that the state can continue to even put the resources in to keep those you know, pro prisons operational. So we can go on to the next final piece. The final piece is put money back into communities, reinvest resources saved from decarceration, from closing prisons, put the funds back into the communities that have been most disproportionately harmed by incarceration. Black and brown communities in Milwaukee, indigenous communities, poor white communities. So definitely looking at it from a racial equity and also an economic equity perspective. And you know, put the money back into, as I mentioned before, we know that when we invest in housing, jobs, healthcare, education, treatment programming, that's actually gonna create safer, healthier, and stronger communities that we all deserve. And also violence prevention is another big piece where we can invest these resources, There's many resources, many ways that we could spend the funds better that would actually produce better outcomes in terms of public safety outcomes, but also helping formerly incarcerated people thrive and flourish within communities. When we actually invest in people coming back out, we know that that's gonna produce better outcomes. So definitely appreciate your time, appreciate you listening, and looking forward to hearing all the testimony. And thanks for turning on. I see definitely want to also mention that I appreciate all the support from people who have loved ones who are currently incarcerated and also formerly incarcerated people because this work has really been led and by people who have been most impacted. So people who have loved ones currently in Wapak, people who have loved ones currently in Green, Green Bay, but also people who have been incarcerated in those prisons and also MSDF. It's really led by formerly incarcerated people and people who have loved ones currently incarcerated. And that's really key, I think, is centering the voices and the strategies of people who have been most impacted. I see many in this room tonight, so really appreciate the turnout and all the work and effort that all have been putting into this campaign and I feel like we're really gaining some traction. We're really gonna see some real change in the state. We just have to keep it up and keep going. So thank you everyone. Thank you both, Mark and James. Uh, very brave, very informed. Um, and yes, a great turnout. We have about 70 people here for those watching online. I'm not sure how many are there. Uh, so we'd like to invite you now to share testimony. Uh, since so many newer folks have entered, we just encourage those of you who are sharing testimony to uh, make a line over here. And uh, after each, if you'd like a response, or if you're asking a question, uh, the state representatives and Mark and James can give some sort of response. Uh, just a couple of cues. I'll give you a little visual cue when uh, three minutes are up. And also, please don't say the name of your loved one who is incarcerated inside. It's very important that uh, you know, there's no retribution taken against them because uh, you're speaking on their behalf. So uh, come on up to the mic, friend, and thank you. Hi. Um, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, my husband is currently incarcerated at Wapai Correctional Institution. And he was um, part of what went on in the 90s um, for um, the extensive sentencing of um, African American men in the 90s. Well, he's currently has been incarcerated at Wapan Correctional Institution for 28 years, and he was sentenced to a parole date, which is past his 
his um, life expense expectancy. Well, um, he was a youth, so he was 20 years old when he committed this crime. And I would like for um, the legislators to possibly consider um, talking about the culpability of youthful offenders. So currently the age to be considered as a youthful offender is 17 and under, but as science has shown, um, the brain capacity of, uh, of an individual from the age 18 to 20 is pretty much the same as um, a minor, which is 17 and under. And so because of this, he wouldn't, he will never have the eligibility of parole, and he is, um, in my opinion, rehabilitated. So he was a child when he committed this crime, and part of um, being able to release a lot of the offenders, we should look at the age um, of these youthful, youthful offenders that are still incarcerated after all these many of years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. But also the other thing that um, I've experienced, so there was that that I wanted to talk about, but also while he was incarcerated during this lockdown, um, he was actually, his water was shut off to his cell. So he um, did not have any water for 48 hours and um, they weren't concerned about if he was dehydrated. They did not bring him any water. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of things are going on in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you're you're totally right on the science. And uh, boy, I, I made bad choices uh, up until well, I mean, yesterday, probably yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's not always an age-related thing, but uh, the. The idea that we are incarcerating so many people and also that we are incarcerating them at Waupun, which should not exist as an institution that has people in it at all, uh, is, uh, is noted. Uh, what we see in the legislature now, unfortunately, is bill after bill after bill that seeks to increase criminal penalties, and we do not see things coming in front of us that, that go the other way and that pare down all those things or that would treat uh, children as children. I mean, uh, it is still unconscionable that Wisconsin continues to incarcerate both so many people generally and 17-year-olds as if they are adults. Yeah. And real quick to jump in, I mean, I, I would say 98% of what we see is things that, you know, increase the, the impacts of um, incarceration in our communities. I think there are less than 2% of bills, actually, um, that that are beneficial, that are going through the legislature right now. Uh, one, a bill to bring 17-year-olds back um, into the youth system from the adult system. Um, and my predecessor worked on that um, alongside a lot of the stakeholders on this panel um, and in this room, um, and now Republicans are actually taking it up, um, which is a great thing. Um, to think about the, the grand continuum, though, yes, I agree with you 100%. Uh, we know that folks um, don't fully develop their mental capacity until they're 24. Um, and we have began to make some shifts, right? We've, um, you know, we created a facility specifically for some folks who are, um, you know, under the age of 24 um, to go to before they transition into uh, other facilities. but. That shouldn't, we need to do much better than that. Um, and honestly, the, even that facility is, is horrible in Racine, let's be real. Um, and this, these are the conversations that we're having in 2023, where now all the data shows um, that we can, you know, that the outcomes, if we make these better choices, um, will build a better continuum of public safety um, in our broader, com our broader community. Um, and that's things that we've been working on with, with the package of bills that we've introduced um, alongside a bunch of the things that we are still working on um, based off the experiences we hear from folks like you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of things out there and then make a plea. That's so, that's, I'm Maria Douglas. 
I'm part of I Voted Concerts, getting out the vote in 11 different states and every jurisdiction um, using free concerts if you vote. Um, top five artists in major cities, on the board of directors of Disability Rights Wisconsin, and in the, I'm one of the co-chairs of the criminal justice reform, jail voting, and rights restoration subgroup of the Wisconsin Voting Rights Coalition, like I said, and education committee of the Disability Rights, Voting Rights Coalition. There's so many things. Um, this is all connected. So black and indigenous people are incarcerated at seven times the rate of white people in this state. We have the lo longest parole stay in the nation. We also are the most segregated city in the most segregated state in the whole nation. And also the prefrontal cortex, I'm a psychologist, um, is fully developed at age 26. And now they're saying for boys it might even be later. Okay, whopping. The prison conditions that I've seen, there. The water is opaque yellow brown. People are being murdered in prison. And it's like, this needs to be, we need to start talking about this. Um, and being murdered by not give, being um, provided their medication, medical services, they're being murdered by other inmates, correctional officers, this stuff is happening. We have areas in Milwaukee where within a five block radius, there's a hot spot and over 200 confidential informants. There aren't even 200 people that you could, how do they even fit that many people in a five block radius? And people are getting charged every day with things they may or may not have committed. These are the things that we need to start talking about. All of this to say, we're um, the, the jail voting um, rights restoration subgroup of the Wisconsin Voting Rights Coalition. We are starting to host a summit quarterly. It's at Marne in the Third Ward. It's going to be hybrid. The first one is we got into every, to teach all the sheriffs and county jail administrators in the whole state of Wisconsin, their CEUs. Um, as far as voting rights. So if you are serving, and this, this is another message that needs to get out, because there's a lack of general knowledge from reliable sources. I think we can all say this is a reliable source here, because our black and brown communities, I'm a part of the brown community, we're targeted with mis and disinformation every single day. So this is a place to know. If you are off of paper, you can vote. If you're serving a misdemeanor, consecutive misdemeanors, you can vote. And until we get the maps fixed, we really need every single black and brown vote, especially up in here. Thank okay, you. so that's, um, that's jail voting, third, fourth Sunday in February, come, we're having live music, DJ, spoken word, art, free. Thank you. Bye. I'm Joyce Zellwinger. I'm active both in Wisdom and the Old Law and Compassionate Release Committee and then Transformational Justice Committee for MICA. But I'm here to speak for a brother who is incarcerated at Wapan. He shared this this month. This is an update from December. This place is getting worse instead of better. I was denied my only hour of rec the last two weeks being accused of covering my window. I post a five by five inch card that I made for med pass. I get an AM and bedtime med, and this is the only time I post my sign. The WCI considers this covering your window. I only post the small sign when I expect meds, expecting them to be passed. I now stopped posting my small sign and have been denied, missed, skipped on my medication three times in the last week. I do file a complaint each time. On 12-11-23, I was called to see the dentist and I'd been on the list for three years for a single filling replacement. The tooth was now too damaged to be filled and had to be pulled. The pulling went horribly. The dentist broke the truth, tried to drill out the roots, and after 70 minutes, I was sent on my way 
He said, put in a slip if he missed some of the tooth. The sound, that sounds like a joke, but six, years, six days later, on a weekend, my entire left side of my face looks like I swallowed a baseball. I can feel the inner root still. My gums on that side are cherry red in flame. I was told to write the dentist, and hopefully he's around. I'm guessing he'll be in because he said in a joking manner, I'll see you next week if I miss some of that tooth. This, the week of deer gun season, we never received wreck or a single shower. We went 11 days without being offered a shower. Myself and many others put in a complaint never to receive an acknowledgement. They will wait two weeks and if anybody resubmits, will be out of the 15-day filing. Not to mention we are only allowed one complaint per week regarding one issue. So if you're, if you're skipped your meds, denied rec, or have bird droppings in your food, you better pick only one. The beds here at WCI hang by chains, so they're three feet off the ground. Last night I got to take a leak, got up to take a leak, and stepped on something. It screamed. And I thought nothing of it, thinking it was the family cat, until a minute after I realized I'm not at home and I have no cat here. Whatever it was, I have no clue, but it seemed, it felt like the size of a small football or a small cat. I usually sleep with my TV on all night and place it on the floor to keep unwanted trespassers away. Hmm. Thank you. That's the reality of Wapun. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for uplifting their testimony. When we visited, um, when we first got, a, me and Ryan first got elected, we made sure that the first thing on our docket was to try and visit as many correctional facilities as possible. Um, and we've, I think we're closer to 10. Um, 10 now, we still, we still have many to get to. Um, and we pushed for going to Waupon um, in June. Um, when we went to Waupon, um, in every facility we, are, we asked, so, asked for our, ourselves to be able to speak with um, folks in our care um, so that we could have real conversations about their needs. Um, and we heard the gambit of what they're, what they're dealing with and a lot of these things that you're talking about. Um, the testimony you're, you're giving now reminds me of a person that I remember having a conversation with and it might be the same person. Um, we know that folks haven't had the ability to have showers um, for weeks. Um, when we asked about it, um, to the, we asked the warden and other, other staff about it. Um, they said, that's fine because they have the ability, they have water in their cells and, you know, they have the ability to do what is called a bird bath. What we call in here a bird bath. And my first response was, we don't, in my community, we don't call that a bird bath. And then... I said that's, that's completely unjust, um, especially knowing the temperature of this space right now, which at the time felt like over 100 degrees. Um, and we later got confirmation that that was the actual temperature in that space. And we also saw a pigeon in that space simultaneously. Um, so we, you know, and along those same lines, we also found out that due to the lack of medical staff, the folks who are taking around um, the, the medication that a lot of folks need are our correctional officers, which is horrible, right? Because some, because folks, some folks need specific pills and they need to take them in a specific order and we know correctional staff don't get that information. Um, and they don't always share that information. And if, the, if a pill count is off, the correctional officer doesn't know that. Or they might, 
right? Um, these conditions that folks are facing in all of our institutions is, is heinous, especially when it comes to Wapon and Green Bay, um, which is why in the, in the package that we, you know, we work with folks to develop, one of the first bills that we talked about was um, ensuring that folks had access to showers um, more than one time a week, which, you know, DOC also was like, that's okay. <laughs> we said that's unethical. Um, we also, me and Ryan also debated on what's the length of a, of a shower, and we went back and forth on, on that. It's um, 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, I might agree with you sometimes on that. Um, my, my thoughts was longer than Ryan's. Ryan was like, five minutes, we're good. Uh, right? That's what you said, five to seven minutes? I was like, nah. Uh, but... Um, at the end of the day, the bills that we that we authored in our conditions of confinement package, um, which you can you can find um, online, and we have an explainer that um, Gabby can share in the chat, and we can send the folks via email, um, are are all a reflection of uh, things that can be changed administrati administratively, like we're outlined um, by by Mark and you know um, this panel. But we wanted to ensure that they were codified through law. Why? Because at the end of the day, if anything changes administratively, um, you know, anybody can choose to not, you know, not follow administrative rules. If they're codified through law, DOC can be held accountable um, for their, their missteps. Um, and we got pushback from DLC about the codification of some of these laws, and they were like, we should just add more money to make it happen. Uh, they have a lot of money. Um, we need to hold these folks accountable because we know, again, like I said earlier, if we aren't, um, if we don't do right by these folks while they're incarcerated, we will deal with the repercussions of that um, when they are not. So again, thank you. And I'll just add to it is deeply shameful that in 2023 that we go into institutions and we say, if you could change anything about this place, what would it be? And it's not, you know, I, I'd like a, an additional hour of programming. It's I want to do literally anything relevant to my interests so that I can be better when I leave here. Or it's I just want to see my family. Or it's I want to take a shower this week. Or at MSDF, and this almost broke me, the answer was, I want to see the sky. In a building that was built in 2008. In a building which is inexpressibly cruel, which has a column of cooled air down the middle of it for the staff, but very specifically leaves the people that we incarcerate to the elements. Uh, it is, it is difficult to be in those institutions, even for the hours that it takes to ask and, and get answers to those questions, and we have to do so much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're probably going to work out some sort of number system for those that are standing so that they don't have to stand the whole time. Uh, also, we have many questions online as well as here, and so uh, I'm just going to invite everybody to keep it to three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Jennifer. I live in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and we have a loved one that's incarcerated under the old law. He's been so far in, incarcerated for 40 years, and I'm going to try to chop this down to three minutes. Uh, the cruelty of the parole process extends far beyond the incarcerated individual. Actions taken by the nominated parole chair, John Erkenbach, has victimized families and loved ones, as well as every taxpayer and member of society who believes that laws and rules should be applied fairly, equally, mm. honestly, and transparently. These may seem like grand accusations and rhetoric, but nothing could be further from the truth. And I'll share a little bit, a few experiences. This is from the gentleman's oldest sister. Um, she said her little brother committed a crime when she was 33, and their family <clears throat> um, believed he needed to be incarcerated. They did all of the visits, uh, tens of thousands of miles, invested money with the phone calls and electronics and everything like that, and they were trusting in the system would do their end of the part as um, the inmate was in there. 
Um, she says, suffice to say, our emotional commitment aside, our investment of time and a couple hundred thousands of dollars over 40 years gives us a standing in this process. We have a right to speak and an expectation that our voices matter. Um, <clears throat> he's been up parole for 15 times and they were usually 12 month defers and then there was a seven month defer and then a 10 and a 10 and then a 24. So when it was the seven month defer, the family was uh, making his bedroom for him and filling up with clothes. We had a car for him, everything was ready to go. He got out of the, the prison to go get his driver's license and thought things were gonna be rolling fine. Um, and so then he went to his parole hearing and they'll either say insufficient time for punishment or release at this time poses an unreasonable risk. Um, so anyway, like I said, I'm chopping this down. So uh, anyway, during the period of all these setbacks, uh, during this period, John Erkenbach was nominated parole chair by Mr. Evers. My brother's positive adjustment continued. The commitment of our family and loved ones has not wavered. Uh, his oldest sister wrote Mr. Eckenbach, Erkenbach and outlined why the judge's voice should have impact in the sufficient time punished criteria. He responded, that judge doesn't determine suitability for parole, I do. Hmm. Citing nothing new, Mr. Erkenbach rejected the commission's recommendation for this person um, who's incarcerated and increased the defer to 24 months. I guess he really can do whatever he wants to do. Due to the criteria, have so uh, due to the criteria having so little meaning of the whim of one man can weld the might of the state any which way he choose i say no we say no every person should have security in knowing that the laws rules and criteria will be enforced with integrity uh, fairness consistency and transparency are expectations that we must demand from those we bestow in, uh, with power from the state. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated situation. Mr. Erkenbach has increased defers and altered the course of parole in a number of cases to reflect his personal brand of justice. When law or criteria are applied and unequally, um, it, it ends up suffering, everyone suffers. So his sister suffers today, our loved ones suffer. Um, this person's daughter will suffer and which of our families are gonna suffer tomorrow. Mr. Evers needs to ask for Mr. Erkenbach's resignation. He needs to be, he needs to appoint an oversight committee to vet the files and reverse these arbitrary parole postponements, which are defers. Lastly, he needs to nominate a parole chair capable of infusing the parole process with the integrity he promised while campaigning for our votes, the end. Thank you. I agree. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Yante Turner. My pronouns are he, him, his. I organize with the collective called Sunseeker MKE. We're a black trans abolitionist. Thanks. We're a black trans abolitionist collective here in Milwaukee, doing a lot of work around security and safety for black communities. Um, and. Joy James, Miriam Kaba have been talking about community a lot. And um, one thing that I've learned from both of those people, um, and along with so many other folks marching in the streets, dying in the streets, dying in prisons, and so forth, um, is that community is going to take a lot more efforts than policy and legislation, but it's also going to take work from community. So I'm wondering what tips, tools, ideas you all have for folks on the ground, grassroots, that are not just interested in pushing policy and legislation. What a million experiments, what alternatives can we invest in? Um, and do and work for as community folks as we welcome folks home and work for folks to come home. Mm. Um, I think that my second thing is we are working on a community crisis program that focuses on building structures of care and institutions of care for just regular community members. So we're teaching folks how to have the skills to be intervening in crisis and violence. Um, and that's not going to be the only thing. It can't be the only thing. So I'm wondering all of the other things. <laughs> Got you. Anybody want to take that first? 
it's, it's all of the things, right? I mean, every community program is an alternative to incarceration, and our communities are being starved because we are investing in all the wrong things. And I, I appreciate your work, Yante, and I wish I had better answers. My, my lane is, is legislation. Um, but even, even bringing those things up, even when they don't get a hearing, it means that we can have conversations around the horrific conditions in our institutions and the horrific condition which is inherent in incarcerating somebody. And I, uh, I, I am glad that you're, you're giving us that bigger context question. Ryan doesn't know community, that's why. <laughs> I'm just messing around. Um, no, but uh, legit, there are so many ways that we can help folks, um, especially folks who are returning to our community. Um, there is a huge lack of housing um, access for a lot of folks when they return to our communities, um, especially because for some reason, um, a lot of landlords believe that folks who are who have been formerly incarcerated don't make good tenants, um, and that they somehow are going to break their home, the homes that they are renting. Like we literally had to to combat that that narrative in committee um, several times, um, and had that conversations with folks um, from different lobbyist groups about that. Um, but we need to, in our process of creating. Um, community housing for folks. Um, I know a lot of folks are doing work um, related to cooperatives, um, and, and, and some other folks are, are looking to become homeowners um, or landlords themselves, but do that in a way that um, is more equitable. Um, as we think about that, think about how you prioritize folks who are coming out of the, um, out of the carceral system, um, because those are the folks who are struggling with housing um, the most. Um, I was just at Repairs of the Breach literally two, two three weeks ago, um, and they talked about how a lot of the folks that um, were just released from MSDF and other, other county-owned facilities, ran faci facilities, are folks that they interact with on a daily basis, um, and they are a, they are a daytime, sh daytime, daytime shelter right off um, off of Elite, right next, next to the, um, the Cox building, right? So as we think about those support systems, that's one piece of it. As we think about helping folks find gainful employment um, and also be connected to, um, to our communities in a way that's um, symbiotic, um, that's the critical piece of the conversation that um, our communities often end up forgetting um, because these folks, um, are impacted by a system that sometimes we are, we've been, um, we believe that everyone in that system are, are out to harm us, right? Um, and, and I say this as, as someone who, um, you know, who's been directly impacted by, uh, who has had family members that have been directly impacted by the system um, and have lost family members that have, um, to folks who have been who are in the system right now, um, and, and I still do that advocacy. Um, I lost my brother's birthday was literally two days ago. He died in 2021. Um, well, 2020 during the pandemic, he was uh, killed in his apartment, and I and I advocate every day to improve the conditions for folks who are incarcerated, including the person who killed him, uh, because I understand that one day. Um, he might come back to our community, um, and he should be able to, to function in our community um, as well and contribute back to the society um, that he harmed. Um, that, comes, that goes to our lowest offenders, to our highest offenders. Um, justice looks like um, taking care of each other, um, and it includes all of us, not just a select few. Um, I just had a quick that a key piece to me is investing in organizations led by directly impacted people. There's a lot of great work in Milwaukee and across the state that's being led by those who've been most impacted. Glenn Martin, who's the founder of Just Leadership USA, said that the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from power and resources. So it's really time to change that and really start to invest in organizations like Expo. I see a lot of Expo 
members, leaders are here tonight. Expo is really doing great work in the community. Peer support services, organizing work. I saw Shannon Ross earlier, the community, another great organization led by a directly impacted individual. All of us are none, has the chapter in Wisconsin now, Breaking Barriers Mentoring. Project Return, I see, I've served on the board of Project Return for over six years. Many, Project Return has several staff members who are formerly incarcerated. And so I feel like really <coughs> investing in those organizations is going to be key to this in terms of advancing what, and you know, it's really those individuals who've been most impacted that really have the solutions really should be leading the work. So a lot of these organizations are underfunded, under-resourced, and I feel like that can really change everything if we start to really make investments in those organizations. So just wanted to add that piece. Uh, I think yeah. we'll just, because I want to make sure everybody yeah. gets a chance to speak. I think that's important. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Tim Hall, and I am the justice promoter for the Racine Dominican Sisters. I'm here on their behalf because they care about this issue passionately. I'm honored to share uh, an emailed response to an inquiry from Wisdom Wisconsin's prison outreach program from an incarcerated person. Negativity consumes the day. A minute feels longer than it should. These inhumane conditions has had a negative impact on us. Many are extremely depressed and struggling for a solution to that problem. Some have lashed out, having no other means to express their frustration. Some have sought escape through dangerous substances, and some have overdosed. Others talk about taking a stand. Others want to end their lives. These facts are often ignored or trivialized. Simply, there's nothing productive happening inside this place. No programs, sequential movement. They're crafty at how they're covering it up. They've denied what they're doing, knowing our claims will be ignored and trivialized outside, too. Stanley's being run by a tight group of family and or friends that engages in arbitrary or capricious abuses of power and operate under a code of silence. There's no accountability because there's no one here to hold them accountable. No independent review because the personal relationships creates a conflict of interest that taints investigations with bias. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So that testimony came at an incredible time because the individual in the back who wanted to know what we can do to support individuals who are coming home, that answer on a very micro level is accountability. Certainly, we're not capable of addressing each and every single violation that the Department of Corrections engages in, right? But I'm sure we each know somebody on the inside. And so that advocacy begins with holding the Department of Corrections accountable. We get tens of dozens of emails on a daily basis saying, hey, James, I'm going home in 30 days. Do you have any resources? Because I haven't seen my social worker in the past six months. How ridiculous is that? The Department of Corrections forward-facing policy is that they are committed to re-entry practices. They continue to say that they spend millions and millions of dollars to provide these services, to have staff giving these individuals the opportunities that they need to come home. And the reality is, that's just not happening. So when we get these reports, the best thing that I can encourage you to do is to reach out to the facility and say, this is what I am understanding. Why isn't the DOC acting like it needs to be? What Tim just read, there is no accountability. There is no way to hold transparency from a system who is absolutely committed to being shrouded in secrecy. They do not want to be public. They do not want the public to know about the realities of those conditions. So they have brilliant marketing professionals who come in and they tell you, oh, well, we have the Becky Young grant and, and we have DWD and we have these reentry uh, programs that we offer. But the difference between the narrative that they're selling and the experience for the tens of thousands of men and women who are incarcerated are far, far different. So we can absolutely look to the community about the resources and organizations that are doing incredible work, but we also have to do the work of holding the DOC accountable 
for the lack of things that it is doing that it claims to be doing. So to that question that you asked, that's what I would encourage you to do. If you hear about something or the DOC is communicate something, look behind the, look behind the superficial narrative and see what's really going on. Good evening, I'm Dave from Expo. This is an email sent in to Wisdom. If we could read the secret history of those we would like to punish, we would find in each life enough grief and suffering to make us stop wishing more on them. I'm Mike M.E., I use his initials, 43 years old, black male, who have been in the Wisconsin Correctional System since I was 18. This lockdown we have now affected, has affected my health mentally and physically. I have a number of chronic illnesses, degenerative disc disease, nerve damage, chronic kidney disease, and mental health issues. I have been transferred into a pond on June 20th. I still haven't seen the doctor yet regarding these chronic illnesses. The lockdown is the reason for the backlogs, and I'm only allowed to see my clinician every two weeks due to the staffing crisis for only 30 minutes. When I, I, when I used to receive one one-on-one -on -one treatment once a week for an hour, I am under the old law. I see the parole again this October. And for the sixth time, uh, lack of programs for my mental health has kept me in for 25 years. We are suffering. I have tried to kill myself in Green Bay by trying to jump over the highest tire in 21 and 2022. And when Pond received, we received showers once a week, rec once a week, hot meals only for lunch Monday through Friday, bag meals all weekend, no visitors, no Zoom. All the issues are causing me to suffer from serious emotional distress. I have filed a civil lawsuit against Green Bay Correctional for the lack of mental health treatment. Now Wapan is doing the same thing. We humans still and our rights are still being violated every day. I am suffering from my mental health issues daily. GP is like being in segregation now, general population, due to this lockdown. I will do more time in prison because there are no programs taking place. The staff shortage is BS. I have witnesses, officers run an inmate cell like the ATF. The conditions are worsening every day. The government has the power to stop. The suffering, this is on them. The blood, death, suicide. Only they can stop the crisis. Mm. <clears throat> Nobody is in Nobody is as powerful as we make them out to be, a quote from Alice Walker. We are humans, too. Mm. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. My brother is incarcerated in Oshkosh Correctional Institution, and um, we are very, my family and I are very familiar with the DOC. Uh, my brother has been incarcerated for almost 40 years. He um, started his incarceration at the, probably the age of around 20, 21. Mm. He's been in Waupun, he's been in Green Bay. The officers at Waupun nearly killed him. Uh, then they transferred him to Green Bay after they fixed him back up. A lot, of, a lot is behind that, so I won't even get into that. But we get hit twice from the legal system, I won't even call it a criminal justice system. It's a legal system, mm -hmm. okay? And then we get hit again when we have to go visit him and they tell us we can't touch, we have to wear masks. COVID is gonna be here forever, so maybe they're gonna just have lockdowns forever. That's not the solution. The DLC has to be accountable for what they're doing. They don't wanna answer to anyone. I've emailed the warden asking, what protocol are you using to say uh, you have to wear masks? We can't touch our loved ones. That is a violation of human rights, and it's not fair. And so we visited my brother on Thanksgiving. We're going again soon, only to say that we can't touch. Mm -hmm. They need human touch. They need to know that they're loved. It's not right. So we need the DOC to be accountable. I got a lot of other things to say, but I won't say it now. But 
be accountable. Kevin Carr, secretary, all the wardens, you got to be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, Ryan, do you want to speak to the specific embrace yeah, piece of legislation? We have uh, we've had debates in our office about uh, how long a hug is too long. Uh, because human touch is, the, the data again is there, that that is a, a real necessary thing. And we, we've heard in a couple pieces of testimony here the idea of uh, understaffing. Uh, that is frankly bullshit. We have an overabundance of staff for the people, the number of people that we should be incarcerating. The, the problem is not one of uh, understaffing, it's of overpopulation and that we're just locking up too many people. Both the DOC and county institutions use the idea of understaffing as an answer to literally everything, from the reason that people can't hug each other during a visit, to not allowing visits in the first place, to showers, uh, it has got to stop. And the answer is not to throw more money at a broken, inhumane system. Facts. Also in the piece of, in, in that same package, we also, that same piece of legislation, we also address the ability for for folks who are incarcerated to take um, take the photos um, or the drawings that their children do back to their cells. Um, currently, that's not they don't have the ability to do that. They argue that there is the potential of of drugs being infused into that paper, which makes no sense because it's the paper provided by the DLC. Um, these are these are things that are that are common sense, that are really absurd, that we don't seem to be able to rectify um, through administrative rules, so we need to codify them in law so that the administration has to do what they need to do. Um, and that the same applies to our county facilities. Milwaukee County jails stopped providing, um, stopped the ability for folks to be able to have visitation, what, 20 years ago? 22. 22 years ago, because someone Un, somehow got a screwdriver and unscrewed a window and, and, and ran away. Um, it's, it's absurd that that is the reason that that happened, and they still don't allow visitation in Milwaukee County jails at all. At all. Because they they're freaking lazy. Um, so let's keep on going, but I wanted to bring that up um, to let folks know that we are working on that. My name is Kyle. Um, been incarcerated twice myself in prison. And I just wanted to let everyone know that relationships are a very important part. We were created to be in relationships. But these people are having those relationships taken away. They have no access to walk and rec. They have no access to the chapel and, and all the other things where they're able to develop the relationships, where they're encouraged to grow. It was in these same relationships that I finally started understanding what life was about, where I started finding healing, where I found a change in my life through people like breaking the chains um, and all the other things. I found a good community that helped me be released and have relationships when I got released. These people also don't have relationships with their family members. That's being cut down. How are they supposed to be encouraged to grow when they have Part of their key core is a human being cut out of them. We need relationships. Mm. I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Mm. Hi, my name is Carrie Hurdy. Um, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm not from Milwaukee. <clears throat> this is a picture of my daughter. Her name is Sylvia Therian. She died in the Milwaukee County Jail last December while she was on suicide watch. Now they haven't released the video because it could paint a different picture about the jail but the picture that they don't paint is what is really going on inside of there. She had extensive mental health issues for a very long time, from the time she was three. She probably shouldn't have even been in there, but they decided to keep her. They say that they don't have places to put these people. 
that they have to remain there. That's not true. They can move them around if they want to, if they want to be honest about the care that the people really need inside these places. Prisons, jails, they're not institutions. They're not meant to care for people like that. And our family members are dying. Now my daughter was only 20 years old. Beside her mental issues, she was able to graduate at 18 like a normal child. All because I cared for her and I pushed her and I wanted her to be the best she could be. She wasn't even sentenced when she was in there for 10 months. I would call the mental health division. They would tell me that she was okay, that they were constantly watching her. If they were constantly watching her, I wouldn't be here today. These facilities are not following their own policies. When it comes to suicide watch, it's supposed to be every 15 minutes. They did not check on her for after 20 minutes. Once they got in there with ME, they were locked out. They had to go and find an officer, which took another few minutes. If they would have had never given her the item, she would be here if they would follow their own policies. If we as a community would stand up and say we need to look into WellPath, who is doing the mental health and the medical health inside there, we would see a real problem. I have been fighting for the audit for the Milwaukee County Jail. And I am gonna to continue to fight because I think a lot of people really know what's going on in there, but are really too scared to say anything. There is no witness protection for these people. So they're looked at as people who are just nothing. They're scared to come forward because if they end up back in the Milwaukee County Jail, how they will be treated, that they could be the next death, that they could be the next case. And it's not okay, not in our prisons and not in our jails. Wellpath, Wellpath is a multi-billion dollar company. They are nationwide. A lot of people don't know that. I know that because after the death of my daughter, I started to research. I wanted to know who really took care of my daughter. There's many states, many jails, many institutions that they are in that deaths are happening in. Some of these states have said, you know what, we want an audit. Once they do the audit, they're no longer in their jails. Mm -hmm. I just want everybody to think about that because there is one in every four person or child who has a mental health issue. It is a crisis in our communities, in our nation, everywhere. And when they say we need help, we need help inside those jails for these people so that when they come out, they are different. If you don't have anybody inside there helping them, how are they going to be different when they come out? Everybody needs somebody. Sylvia needed somebody. I was always there. I believe in no child left behind. And I still do not leave my child behind. Thank you. Hi. I, I want to thank Carrie uh, briefly here. Uh, Sylvia was one of six individuals who died within a 14-month span at the Milwaukee County Jail. We failed her, uh, and we fail every day that we no, fail to make change that would prevent uh, a, another death like that. 
Um, I am incredibly grateful uh, to Carrie for her advocacy, and uh, she, she referred to it there, but she is the reason that we will have an audit of the jail uh, th this next year. Uh, she is the reason that we brought forward legislation for a constitutional amendment that would allow counties to take control of their jail away from sheriffs uh, and give it to, uh, to their county boards uh, and for much of this other legislation. And uh, I, I'm so <laughs> heartbroken but also uh, glad that, that uh, Sylvia's legacy will be one of change uh, through her mother. And thank you. Thank you. Um, but just a quick update. We have about 15 minutes left, and I do want to read off the questions from the online folks. Priorities given to you folks who have been standing in line this whole time. Good evening, Brother Troy. Uh, I hear a staffing crisis as an excuse for, uh, you know, locking people down and not having, but I'm saying like, well, if there's a shortage and if money's a problem, our priorities are mixed because if we can find $500 million to rebuild a baseball stadium, then how can we can put more money into the, you know, getting what the, what the people behind bars need? Uh, the same thing at the county jail. Uh, I'm, I'm going to school to be a paralegal, so uh, during the COVID, they said that there was a shortage, a long shortage of public defenders. And, but I, I would call Mr. Reed, the director, and I said, that's a violation of people's due process to have them just sitting and sitting at one status conference after another. It's the same thing with people in prison. It's cruel and unusual punishment is a violation of the Constitution, not having showers. Somebody called me today and found out I was coming here. She said, could you let them know that I put in a visiting form to see my loved one that left the county jail and is at the Cheetah, but the, the she doesn't get a call from the PO, the, the inmate at, at the, the young lady in Tachita. She just keeps getting denied. She said the friend is denied, her kids are denied, her mother and father is denied, and she said, what's going on? And then we talked about, I heard Joyce talk about compassion and release. When I was in Oshkosh, there's a, there's a unit, and the whole unit was elderly people. And I'm like, oh my God. If you've been in jail all these years and you're in your 70s and 80s, who can you harm? Why don't the Department of Corrections put them on the outside and, and, and the facilities like nursing homes where they can be monitored by staff and then the families can come and have contact with them so that they don't have to die alone by themselves? How much sense does that make to have someone incarcerated behind bars dying with cancer or fourth, fourth stage whatever, but their loved ones are not there? It costs, it's a lot more cost effective to have someone in the community. And then uh, when I talked about housing, she just was talking about her daughter, and it brings up a lot of stress and memories. I was at MSDF five times over the years. Twice I was there when somebody had committed suicide, and once I was placed on suicide watch. <coughs> they put you in a black veil pros, take away all your clothes, put you in an air-conditioned room with a, a, a slab of concrete and the cold air blowing. That was it. That was it. That was my therapy to help me in my crises, to strip me naked and put me in an air-conditioned, ice-cold slab. That's where they put me for two days. Thank you. I just want to thank briefly you. comment on that. Uh, thank you for mentioning about staffing, and State Representative Clancy mentioned it. So everybody's aware, the Department of Corrections will not release its staffing matrices. They will not explain why they have demanded that they need a certain amount of staff at every single one of, your, of their facilities. And let it be pointed out that many of the facilities, those staffing matrices, are far, far inflated. So it's just something for people to know, and I know we're short on time, but that's certainly something to know. The DOC will not release its staffing matrices or explain why they're saying they need this overflood of staff at every one of their facilities. Hello. I'm glad y'all made it. See that all y'all here. My name is Lamont Gregory. Um, I work for PAM, P-A-M, Prison Action Milwaukee. And we've been in business in black for 15 years. And I was the inmate about for 20, and I did take a paralegal class. Don't think Walt Pine just got like this. That's why it rose without any authority while people messing with them outside the government. That's why they do it, because they've been doing it for so long. My best advice to you is stop knocking on their door. Do what the young man did a couple weeks ago. 
Do you know the attorney general worked for you as well? His problem is that he got to bring fairness to the trial, to the complaint, to wherever you file. They got little ways, and I've been dealing with them since the 70s. They just feed you bread and water in the whole and some of the cells. You have no TV, no telephone. Our generation bought that. But it's a different generation now. They're a little bit more dangerous than what we were. So when, it, when I went up there to see the conditions a couple of weeks ago, they had some ladies, some grandmas up there protesting. They've been up there, been up there, been up there. Well, I've seen plenty of protesters. They're not giving up those inmates. They're not. It's about money. That little town has prosperous. When I first went up there, my parents came up there. They only had one hotel or one drugstore. Go through there now. That's why they don't give it up. You know, the only way you're going to sweat them, because laws is already on the books. The human rights law. They got one that got judged. The, um, the Army law, I forgot what they call it, Malcolm X went into it. And they violating all of those. And the reason they don't answer, who they gonna answer to? Car? Ever? They take you taking the same complaint right to the people you asking to release them. Mm. The federal judges could tell the governor what to do. He could order the governor to get in those National Guards, National Guards, let me go in there and escort all of those guys to prison direct. But he don't do it because it's not enough pressure. It's not the right pressure on him. Put the right pressure on him and see what happened. Stop asking them. Start protesting in front of their houses. Thank you. Uh, at Madison, start pressing up there. And some of those judges, it's laws on the books. There's no need of making no new laws when you can force those old laws already. And I know they're on the book because I've seen people use them and come out ahead. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Mm. I agree with you. I think uh, my name is Marty Hagedorn. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure that needs to be applied. I mean, there's so many people that are directly and indirectly impacted in my neighborhood, all over the place. Um, and I've, I like, I see so many powerful people in here, like the L Wangers. Like, you know, like I, I would challenge you guys definitely to remain. Like this, this whole thing, Turner. You know, you guys, like, do this again. Let's do this again on 24th and Locust, or let's do this again on 85th and Brown Deer Road. Like, let's. There's a lot of people that are directly and indirectly impacted that need to know these names, Carr and Evers, and you know, these judges and stuff like that. Like, they need to hear Miss Birdie's story. Like, they have a lot of wisdom and a lot to offer to this movement, um, this movement that is exciting. It is building in Wisconsin. Um, uh, so I just want to say, as, like, as an educator, as someone in the classroom, too, uh, and I've been everywhere. I've been, you know, I, and I've taught everything. I've taught German in James Madison. I've taught English at WCLL. I've taught civics at North Division and shop at Obama and Brown Deer. And at several of these places, I'm the only one talking about conflicts and war in the Middle East or mass incarceration and stopping the prison pipeline. But there is usually a couple of teachers in these buildings that all the kids flock to because they're all because those are the ones that are actually keeping it real with the kids. <laughs> those are the ones that are actually having those conversations. But I feel like uh, this really needs to start like at a much earlier, earlier age. This, uh, you know, what um, Mark was pointing out in that PowerPoint. You know, uh, I don't remember what step it was, but like really reinforcing the human element. You know, these are not villains. These are human beings, you know what I'm saying? Like, we need to get rid of some of these words and really humanizing our brothers and sisters and our fathers and mothers and our uncles and aunts, our cousins out here. We need to do it at a younger age in the classrooms. If it's not happening in the block or in our home, we need to challenge the schools to really be doing this. Um, and uh, also, as a member of All of Us or None Wisconsin chapter, like, I know my young people are really excited about the... Uh, the uh, movement to abolish, like, change the verbiage of the 13th Amendment and taking voluntary servitude out of there. And like that's something that, as a teacher, um, I make the time to organize the young people. Like we need to talk to other young people in other schools and let them know like this is something to get excited about. Like we can, you know, really human 
uh, rights shouldn't be political at all. But it is, like, a lot of this atrocity that's happening at the county, state, all these prisons, it's almost like they, they like it, they want it, you know, they, they, they support it. You know, and it shouldn't divide us like, man, we really like need to take the politics out of it and touch more people. So I really commend the Turners, you guys, for being here. And Mark, uh, I need a copy of that blue, that PowerPoint because I like your little blueprint. Uh, <laughs> and I'm excited. I, I also wanted to ask, I know we were short on time, but, you know, they kind of snuck a youth prison in my neighborhood off 76 and Good Hope. And I kind of wanted some information on that, if you know about that. And also... Uh, Another question to you guys you. too would be like, what other things can we look, can we strive for, you know, in, in terms of uh, policy, federal, or I mean state policy in Wisconsin and county policy? Thank Got you. you. Thank and you. we can get to that. L let me let me get later. a pause real quick because yep. we only have a few minutes um, left, and I do want to honor some of the folks in line. We're going to invite people to stop getting in line. Um, I'm still going to try to cover those folks that are there. We're going to extend past. I'm, I'm also addressing the folks that are online and that are watching us. I just want to run through some of their questions real quick and yeah. condensing some of them. We've got a lot of folks online. Um, there is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about what can be done with truth and sentencing, what can happen, what are the alternatives for our loved ones who were sentenced under truth and sentencing. Um, uh, folks say we need to address the vicious cycle, and this has been underscored several times, of not releasing folks to mental health facilities. The beds at mental health facilities are not um, made available or being held for um, incarcerated people so that they never get the mental health care they need. It would be wonderful if we could determine a way to legislate a warm handoff or MOUs to a higher level of care outside past that. Uh, another uh, request here, the uh, <coughs> desire for people to focus uh, on long-term uh, youth offenders who committed uh, violent crimes who have already served 20 plus years with no violations, the parole commission uh, are not releasing these uh, offenders even though they have been in, they have proven themselves over the course of s such a long time. There's no good reason for this. Um, a lot of individuals, and this is an important thing, and I invite you all to stay after. It's not like we're closing at 730. Um, there are so many brilliant people in this room, so many different people organizing in different areas, different access to resources. I need for you to meet one another and share these ideas. Um, someone else asks, and this is an important question, maybe we tie in the preamble. Uh, since we're talking about unaccountability, are our jails and prisons accredited by some standard? What is the measurement of their failure and success? Uh, and then the other th quick three, two questions. When, what is the state's threshold for releasing individuals due to overcrowding? Do they have a number or do they just keep cramming people in a building which is 169 years old, very literally? And then my staff is asking me, how far over time are we prepared to go? Uh, so. Nice. So we're going to get to Mr. S my friend here. All right. Real quick, before you go, let, <laughs> I, 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 my mind won't store all of those questions, um, just knowing how it works. Um, but um, as it relates to the amount of folks that we can, we can overcrowd um, in our facilities, um, the limit is whatever whatever DLC and Evers decides. Um, there is what, what's really weird is because we don't have some laws on the books about a lot of these things, um, we leave it up to administrative rules, um, and then we're asked not to interact with administrative rules because DLC is working on it, um, and we know that it's not being worked on. Um, Evers is talking about changing uh, Wapon into a single cell facility. We know that's not the solution. Ryan talked about the solution to that problem, and that's getting folks out of, who are incarcerated, out of our facilities um, that don't need to be there. Um, and ensuring that, and then we also need, outside of that, re-examining how we monitor folks in community and all of those stipulations, which Mark spoke to, um, <laughs> and we all spoke to earlier. Um, as it relates to, um, Oh man, I spent so much time, time on that question. I can't even remember the other ones. We, we could circle back Boom. to that. We have five people who've been patiently standing for what feels like hours. Cool. My name is Steve Sand. I've got, I'm probably gonna jump around with lots of things to, to share with you. One of the things that's important is 
if you look at the way people are treated, uh, realize that there is laws on the books that if the same way was treated to animals, it would be illegal. Yeah. And I think that's something that needs to be brought up regarding human rights. Something else that's very obvious with DOC, if you look at most of their new forms out there, it shows when they were revised. but. What you need to do is you need to take the initiative that where the word offender is, cross it out, put in people in our care. One of the things I've learned is they don't like that because then they have to hand input that form into their system. But the, in the corner, it shows when it was revised and they're saying that they're not using those words anymore. That's real important to do that. Another thing that isn't done very often is, and you've talked about mental health, people have mental health issues, they have been diagnosed, utilize the ADA. It is a tool. And then one can say, you're, by using the American Disabilities Act, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we use alphabet soup, and I made a mistake there. The American Disabilities Act, not the Assistant District Attorney. The American Disabilities Act, because of that being a federal act, and the state relies on, on money from the feds, that is very important. I can say personally, I was at the House of Correction. I filed numerous grievances. I was there during the time that they changed from the paper to the electronic, the kiosk. Many of my grievances were lost. I was told to stop writing grievances. I was on work release and they were not very happy because actually I took the paper release out after the CO signed it, made a copy of it, took a picture of it and sent it away so that it, and then turned it in. And many of those never made it into the system. If someone was talking about after 15 days, you gotta start all over again. That was one of the big things with my lawsuit that they tried to say is, I did not, ex I did not exhaust administrative remedies. They have the system rigged so that you can't successfully do that. And now with a kiosk, it is even worse. So what I'm saying to you is thank you for listening. I think it's very important what you're, all of you are doing. We do have tools. And the other thing is Wisconsin statutes 328, don't hold me to this, 0.05, okay? We can look but, it up. Uh, you can look it up. But it says what needs to be done. I can tell you, for instance, um, Coming out of the House of Correction, I never saw a social worker. And as far as probation, um, I had 33 rules. I am on the list as a registrant. Uh, of my 33 rules, I was violating 15 of them every single week. And when the PO would say to me, any violations, I'd say, yep, the same 15. And But what it goes exactly to what you said, they would not remove some of those rules, like um, I wasn't allowed to use credit. Well, and or of course the internet restrictions. Does that mean that a Bluetooth when I when I buy gasoline is an internet? I mean these things. The other thing is, you need we need to hold them accountable for clarity. I would not sign my rules because I have things that I don't understand. And no one could answer my question, but they said just sign them. So I ask you, I plead with you, those people that are out there doing advocacy, the different groups, your people with mental health, get them in touch, use the ADA. We got a whole nother set of system out there that we can tap into. And then we're holding them accountable to the feds. Thank you very much. Got Thank you, you Steve. Um, cool. Hi. My name is Megan Kolb. I'm the daughter of Dean Hoffman, who took his own life this past June after just two months of being at Waupun. My dad had a 30-year history of mental illness and was classified as a MH2A per his previous psych eval at Sheboygan, which is the most serious classification for mental health. What we know is that he was brought into a pond during lockdown. He was not given a psych eval upon his arrival, nor when he was moved to his RHU unit per their required standards. He was moved to solitary after not locking up in his cell after his shower because he was afraid due to threats from his cellmate. 
Per witness statements, he called out for three days of his nine days in solitary that he was feeling suicidal. He's not able to sleep and he was hearing voices. Not one person helped him. He took his own life on June 29th and when they finally looked in the trap and found him hanging, he was cold to the touch. This lockdown is inhumane, it needs to end now. I don't want any other inmate to suffer the same fate as my father. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Wilkie, also known as an artist by Silky Dot Jose. And first off, thankful to every single individual in this room for the contribution of advocacy to equity and humanity. Um, and your efforts matter. Um, so continue to put in the good fight towards what you see is right in the world. Uh, I did not know that there's an opportunity to speak this evening, but here we are, life's cool. Um, so yeah, uh, first off, I'm here uh, really on an education standpoint. Um, education comes from the root word educe, which means to induce, to draw out, or to develop from within. And I really, um, just in terms of preventative care, uh, improving our schooling system and turning that into a true education, a development from within. And even for individuals who are currently incarcerated, a scripture is man without vision shall perish. Um, so there's a lot of you know individuals that have no hope or direction for what they wanna do when they get out um, or just how to live life in general. So just we have to work on supporting people's life planning skills and then connecting them with the knowledge, uh, resources, and professionals in those areas so they can develop their expertise that they know was planted inside of them and uh, that they know that they're meant to contribute to the world. Uh, also represent Your Move MKE, uh, which is a hip hop chess club, and they got a grant from DOJ to uh, run a restorative justice cipher program and create a four to six track EP, um, or a four to six track song album about restorative justice, and I'm facilitating that program. So uh, just like Emilio said, if you wanna connect, uh, feel free to check out yourmovemke.org. Otherwise, my personal social is Vision Minds ENT. Appreciate the time and thank you for the good work. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, my name is Kim Cronk and I just learned about this event today. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'm a nurse who's been in healthcare in various capacities for the last 20 years, um, including being a correctional nurse um, in a county jail. So I feel like I gathered some of those observations and experiences to be able to do something about it. Um, I'm a damn good nurse, and I really, really care about people. Um, and I came today to speak. Um, in part, I wanted to share as people are noting, um, people who are incarcerated, and I have many who I love and care about who are behind the walls in various places, um, but I wanna say that Philip Vance was punished this summer for speaking about, out about inhumane conditions at the Stillwater Prison, which is in Minnesota, and today marks his 100th day in solitary confinement for demanding clean um, drinking water and calling out dangerously hot cells he has 80 more days in the hole um, because of that peaceful protest. And this was posted, I think, four or five days ago. So it's been 104 or five days. And I say that to say this. Sometimes people think like, well, that's in Minnesota, or there's so many people. How can we possibly connect? But I think that's the important thing, is that we do hear each other's stories. We do organize. We do hear what's going on. And we do stand up and stick up for one another and do what's right. Um, I'm also locally elected up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I serve on the county board. And that's um, difficult, and I don't say that in a way to say that um, I deserve any emotional support or anything like that, but I'm saying we in Eau Claire County spent about 30, I think it was $36 million on a new county jail within the last 15 years. It's crazy. When I hear about things like this gentleman in the back that said, 
is there a million different things or a million different experiments that we can do? Yes, there are. We just heard about your move, MKE, and restorative justice ciphers. And there's so many different things. This teacher, I wish I would have had, wherever this gentleman went, the teacher that spoke, Marty. I wish I would have had you as a teacher growing up. These are things that we need to invest in, and please pay attention. We need to pay attention to each other. Last night I was at a county board meeting, and we're talking about spending another $3 million to expand our jail booking area. And it's under the guise of COVID and creating space. Um, the gentleman talked about the ADA. Um, laws and rights, and they're saying, well, if we get so overcrowded, what if we have people that really have serious needs and we can't put them in these special cells because our special cells are full? And what I've said and what I'll continue to support and say is, what if we don't have our jails full? What if we do support and invest in these other community entities that keep people from going to jail in the first place? We also passed a referendum where I think we had like nine more police officers for like life. And then I heard crime is down. Calls for service are down in our community. So I think people get really scared. People get really paranoid. And especially in my community, which is very white, we want to protect our property instead of investing in humans. And that's historically been the case. So I, I feel like there's a lot of different things that we can do, but what I would also say, pay attention to people like Philip Vance. Pay attention to people who are standing up. Um, you can look up his particular case, and he's one of so, so many. Um, but we also need to look at what are other areas doing? What are we doing in Milwaukee? I split time between Eau Claire and Milwaukee, and I really want to build and develop relationships here. So I appreciate the fact that people said that and say, how do we support each other? Because we do need to pay attention. Because the mom that lost her daughter in the county jail here, that's heinous. I don't ever want to see anything like that happen again. And I support her for speaking. And, and what, what can we do differently? So please also pay attention. I don't know if you know where Eau Claire County is, but pay attention to what's going on because we are all connected. And so we need to support each other and say, what can we do differently? And how can we stop some of these entry points, especially for our youth, to be coming into the system at all? So thank you. Thank you. And then we're going to have you be the final speaker before the other folks. Thank you. Um, I'll make it quick. My name's Lil Cross. I'm with the Milwaukee Alliance. Um, friend of Carrie's and been helping out with getting justice for Sylvia. Uh, slow, but we'll get there. Um, and thank you to the help of our legislators who have been working on um, the conditions of confinement package. Uh, it's very well received. We do, I just wanted to say that we do have a petition um, to help make um, decisions like improving conditions in the jail more localized, and we would do that through an accountability council, um, and we need support for it. And if you're interested in signing up, I have it here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bobby from Expo, ex-incarcerated people organizing. Um, I'm hearing it today. I hear a lot. I know a lot more because I went into this system at age 20, uh, as a teenager. I walked in Green Bay as a teenager. I experienced that, the Gladiator School. I survived that. I did 27 years, I've been out three. I prepared myself in spite of what the DOC was trying to do to me. Um, I was blessed by uh, John Tate II, who seen in me, mm. I completed what I needed to do to succeed and I was released. Now, we talk about mental, mental health. The very first year, as much as I was prepared, I became a full-time student within a year, um, the trauma, the PTSD, the mental health that been with me for a child that Nate never addressed, came to me suddenly as I'm on the streets walking and being hypersensitive. And it took a year to adjust. And, and in that year, trying to get a job, trying to get a job, I didn't get a job until I used my voice. And that's what I'm here doing today. And to explain that, Wisconsin is Midwestern, but yet we lock up more people than California or New York. That's insane to me. We need top to bottom reform. 
mental health for sure. I'm as an expo, we, uh, we try to affect policy and we work, we all peer support specialists and we all work with individuals returning. And, and, and I got the resources in my community. I got for, for jobs, for education, for, for apprenticeships. It's there, but I'm one man fighting for my whole community. They don't want to put money into to people like me or, or organizations like me that can help people because this is their bread and butter. Tony Ebers is, is governing this state, the one he promised years ago to lower the population. The most people has been locked up, mask incarceration under his watch. So Tony Ebers, Mr. Uh, mass incarceration himself, mm. show up to this table. We here, let's go, let's fix this. Our community are suffering. And all these people are coming back. Example, I've been in Green Bay uh, protesting these lockdowns. I met an individual, fresh out of Green Bay, young kid, at a homeless shelter. He told me, they gave me old clothes, dropped me off across the street, tell me, you have to wait here for the weekend and sign up Monday here mm -hmm. at the homeless shelter. That's how they're treating individuals that are releasing this day. So please. Evers, Mr. Incarceration himself, come to the table. It's here. Thank you. Thank you. We could probably do this daily, right? And still only scratch the surface of the pain that folks are shouldering, of the specific symptoms of everything that is so incredibly wrong, as, as you all and all of these great folks have illustrated. Uh, and it's terrible, because this is just one of many issues that we have to wrestle with. Uh, so, um, in fairness to all of you, in fairness to time, we will host another uh, another forum in February uh, on this topic, a different topic with other folks, and um, share some other information. We'll share that all with you. Uh, you are all welcome to stay here and talk with each other. You can go to the bar and get a Diet Coke like me, or uh, or some water, or hopefully there's a carrot left. But please use this to take action. All of you have a piece of the solution. Obviously, we have been fighting this for many years. Uh, some of us for decades, some of us newer, some of us not because we ever wanted to be in this room, but because an unfortunate turn of fate made us come here. Uh, I thank you for honoring the people that you love. Um, I encourage you to contact your legislators. We have two in this room and a couple of others, two state legislators. Who are you talking about? <sighs> I know where you live. I'm a Zuber frequently. Um, please contact your state legislators, all of them, your state reps and your senators. You know the governor, you can find that his information, your heard secretary, Kevin Carr. All of these folks need to individually hear from you. You may send them a letter, an email today. If you don't know how, half of us will show you how and let you know how to get that contact information. Uh, encouraging folks that are doing the right thing, whatever it is, from tip to tail, whether it's preventing things or diversion or supporting or letter writing or getting involved with groups that have been doing this for years or new groups that are starting up, please connect with those people too. Make sure some of the bills that folks are working on actually get a public hearing. Demand some of the other bills that are there. There are at least three or four other bills outside of your package which are there. Um, some won't see the light of day for one reason or another. Expungement is on the table. Um, some things like... Uh, um, Ending youth... Uh Raise the age, which will, w w Wisconsin is one of the last states in one of the last countries to sentence children as adults. And we just learned from multiple people that are, uh, specifically in the case of men, our brains aren't fully developed till we're 26, but you can sentence a 10 year old, an 11 year old, a 17 year old as an adult. Um, work to get that done. Show all of these folks that these matrices, this data, are more than just numbers, but put your human face and tell that story, whether you're reading the letter of someone who cannot be here, or you're sharing very painfully the story of somebody who is no longer here, let them know that that number that they're disregarding is a real human. Um, and please, please meet one another. Uh, 
their success is built on the fact that you are not getting paid for this, they are getting paid for this, and that they have policies and procedures and are united, and you are just wonderful, beautiful humans. And the mess and the strength are what will hopefully get us victory. Um, a few little updates uh, before we say goodbye. A couple of upcoming events. Uh, we have been offering free uh, yoga and movement for people that were criminal legal system impacted or wrestling with AODA. We're going to expand that, and so starting in January, we'll have free, open to anybody, uh, pay what you want uh, yoga here in this building. Uh, December 29th, in partnership with our friends uh, Your Move Milwaukee, uh, we will be doing uh, a free uh, come figure out what your shirt size and get a free tie and shirt and learn how to look nice for Nana for New Year's kind of event. That's at 1 p.m. at Your Move Milwaukee, which is 1107 uh, West Historic Mitchell Street. And then, I didn't even write that down. I should get a penny. Uh, and then... Uh, February announced the other Bill Phillips Forum will share that. And March 7th, I'd like to see all of you in Madison for the uh, third or fourth annual Day of Empathy, where we will be going to our, and we will show you how for free, uh, go to our elected officials and for $3 advocate and on behalf of what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> What did you say? I missed that. For three dollars and fifty cents. For two, for two fifty. Three fifty. Um, and if you want to learn more about the Day of Empathy, you can visit dream.org uh, as as they are hosting this. Once again, I'd like to thank our guests here. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, Mark and James, and State Representative uh, Darren and State Representative Ryan. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to my crew, many of whom have been here since 9 a.m. Uh, uh, Cheston, Billy, Michaela, Gabby, Ryan. Connie, uh, also Wisconsin Voices, Rid Races, Milwaukee, the tireless ASL interpreters who have been online. We can't see them, but they're there. Uh, Wisdom, Micah, and the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the Milwaukee Turners or being a supporter of any of the things that we do, you can visit us on social media, milwaukeeturner.org also. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you. Take care of one another.